to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about schwa and stress. But first, we made our Lingcom grant goal. So we're now giving out three grants to linguistics communication projects, and the deadline for those applications is the 1st of June, wherever you are, which is very soon. So make sure to get those applications in. That's 2020, in case you're listening from the future. We're actually giving out four. We are giving out more than we originally planned, thanks to Claire Bowen funding a fourth Lincom grant on a project that looks at minoritized languages. And those grant applications are due on June 1st, 2020. So if you're interested in applying for that, go to the website lingcom.org. That's com with two M's, and you'll see all the details there. And if you're listening to this deep in the future, you can go to lingcom.org to see what great projects we funded. Indeed you can. We now have new Lingthusiasm merch. We have uh, little badges for you to wear through Redbubble, which is really exciting, and they're super cute. Oh, interesting. So I think I would call those pins or maybe buttons. Uh, but whatever you call them, they are round circular things that you can pin on your clothes or backpacks that say fun linguistics things on them. Hmm. Yeah, I'd call them button badges as well. I think buttons is kind of ambiguous because you don't know if that's the kind of button you use that you sew into your clothing or that you pin into your clothing. So maybe I like pins. Anyway, you can get these at lingthusiasm.com slash merch, along with more sticker designs and other Lingthusiasm merch, like scarves with the International Phonetic Alphabet on them, and other fun things like that. This month's Patreon bonus episode is about numbers. We look at different counting systems, different number systems, and what using your fingers to count says about you. You can get access to this and 38 other bonus episodes at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. puzzle for us. Awesome. I love a puzzle. I'm going to give you a few words, mm -hmm. and then you can tell me what they have in common. Okay. So our words are about, about, broken, broken, and council. Council. Any thoughts for what they have in common? My immediate thought was I'm sad we don't have Lingthusiasm Think Time music. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we do have theme music. Maybe we could play it a bit again. Mm. Uh about Broken Council, they all start with different letters. They all have different letters in them. I'm assuming it's not something about what they mean. Uh, they're all two syllables long. That's true. So I should give you a couple more examples that also have this thing in common to see if that helps. Okay. So we have About, Broken, Council, Potato, and support. Oh, potato. There goes my true syllable theory. Um, definitely nothing semantic about their meaning. Uh, they still all have completely different letters. So this is, you've actually made it harder with more data, Gretchen. Harder. That's not <laughs> useful. So the thing we want to think about is not just what letters are in them, but what sounds are in them. Right. So is there any sound that all five of these words have in common? I mean, if I look at the spelling, they all have completely different vowels. They don't even have the same vowels. But if I listen to how they're spoken, think about about, broken, and counsel, <gasps> potato, and support... They all have schwa. They all have schwa, which I know is your favorite vowel. I have created this quiz just for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. They all have this uh sound, and it's the coolest little letter that doesn't exist as a written letter in English. It's one of the coolest sounds in English. I love it. We're doing a whole episode. It's schwa time. It's schwa time. So about has that uh in the first syllable, broken has the uh in the second syllable, council has the uh there, potato, support. And there's the uh going all the way through. And here's your second quiz. There's a special thing mm -hmm. about this particular set of five words. They all have schwa in them, but they all have something else that's different about them. 
they're all spelt with the actual different vowels. And when I learned that schwa was this sound that hid across all of the vowels, it doesn't matter what one you write, if it's in an unstressed syllable, and we'll talk about that, it, it becomes a schwa. It explained to me why I find writing some words so difficult. If you don't know how to spell potato, and someone says potato, that could be a PA, that could be a PU. It's really hard to tell, but all of those are written with different vowels, but sound the same in speech. Yeah. And you get words like definitely, which was one of these words that I didn't know how to spell for the longest time. It would give me this red underline. I was like, why? This looks totally reasonable to me. And then I had to learn that the schwa definitely, the schwa there wasn't spelled with an A, it was spelled with an I. But you really can't tell in English because every single vowel letter can represent this particular vowel sound, which is really frustrating when you're a kid learning how to spell. And yet it's really cool when you're a linguist because it's one of these like mysterious things that like once you notice it, it's everywhere. And yet you can go your whole life without noticing it. We talked about all the vowels back in episode 17 with vowel gymnastics and how unlike consonants, vowels exist in this space and they all kind of shift around like a multi-dimensional slide trombone. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's why we went with gymnastics as an, an analogy instead of uh, multi-dimensional trombones. I mean, if someone wants to design a multi-dimensional trombone for me, I'll take it. <laughs> we talked a teeny bit about schwa in that episode, but I have been wanting to do an episode all about schwa for ages. Here we are. Exciting times. I think we should also mention what schwa looks like when it's written in the International Phonetic Alphabet, because it is part of your icon or your whole icon on various different websites, is it not? Yes, if you've ever seen the upside down E looking thing that is the Superlinguo logo, that is the schwa. So schwa is interesting in that it has a name and it also has, like all of the vowels, a representation in the International Phonetic Alphabet. That representation looks like an upside down E. I'm not normally one of these people that has lots of opinions about fonts, but when it comes to how it's written, it is not an upside down E. This is something I'm very uh, <laughs> fussy about. <laughs> what is the difference between a schwa and an upside down lowercase E? Please tell the class, because I don't know. <laughs> if you turn it back up the other way, it looks really unproportioned. Okay. It's like the top of the E is just like way too high up. It looks all weirdly stretched. So like the thicknesses of the letters and so on are like weirdly stretched. Is that the thing? Yeah. The, the height of that little loopy bit of the E, if you turn it back the other way and try and use it as an E, looks a bit, it just makes it look like the E is going to fall over. It's really wobbly. Okay. And I feel like we need to point this out that you know this because you made schwa cookie cutters. Yes, I designed and 3D printed a schwa cookie cutter a few years ago for Christmas gingerbread. <laughs> <laughs> and then a very helpful person on the internet said, couldn't you just have used an e-cookie cutter and turned the cookies upside down? And you were like, no, 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 because the thickness is different. No, you absolutely cannot. <laughs> I feel like, historically speaking, it probably was an upside down E, though, because, like, I know a lot of the uh, IPA symbols are upside down versions or rotated versions of existing letters, because that way they didn't have to, like, typeset new letters back in, like, the metal printing days. Yeah. But I believe you that now that we have digital formats, schwa can have slightly different line thicknesses. Yes, so it has its own representation. It has a name that, like, not many other vowels have names. So technically, it's a mid-central vowel, which just means it's, like, just in the center. It's not high, it's not low, it's not front, it's not back, it's not any of these dimensions that we talk about. It's just the most uh vowel that exists, which is why everything ends up going towards it when it's not stressed, because it's the least exciting thing to do with your mouth. And there's actually a Wikipedia entry for the mid-central vowel, that uh vowel, but schwa is so iconic. Mm -hmm. There's also a separate Wikipedia page just <laughs> to talk about it as schwa. This is how strong its brand is. Schwa's brand is strong. Especially for the vowels, normally if we talk about vowels, you talk about e or e or u, you just say the name of the vowel, or sometimes people say the name of the symbol. So like small cap, i, or open o open O or something like this. But schwa has got this name that doesn't refer to it, the shape of its symbol. It's got its own name. 
The thing that's always tormented me about the name schwa uh-huh. is like, it's a cool name. I will grant you this. But it doesn't have schwa itself in the name. This is true and very disappointing. Other symbols like theta, like theta has a theta in it. Great. We're doing a great job. Good job, theta. Schwa does not have a schwa in it. And I find that kind of disappointing. Disappointing. However, I looked up the history of the name schwa, Mm -hmm. and apparently schwa used to have a schwa in it, and then it stopped, which I now think is even better. So the word schwa is from the Hebrew schwa, for which the classical pronunciation was apparently schwa. Ah, so like before modern Hebrew, it had a schwa in it. So it was like schwa? Exactly. So schwa, schwa. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should start calling it schwa, because then it would have a schwa in it. Amazing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I think one of the things I like about the name of Schwa is that it, like, the name itself encapsulates his history. Yeah. So initially, Schwa or Schwa mm-hmm. is the name of one of these sets of dots that indicates this sound, uh, because Hebrew writing along with Arabic are normally written with just the consonants. And then if you want to indicate what the vowels are, you can add these extra little dots and bits above and below the consonants. Mm-hmm. which most of the time aren't used, but are sometimes used for children or for contexts where you want to be super precise. And so one of the names of these sets of dots indicating the vowels is schwa, which was used to indicate either the uh sound, the schwa sound itself, mm-hmm. or a, eh, which in most languages, the a eh sound is written with what English calls the letter E. <laughs> um, so if you think of the a eh as in cafe or forte, those E's uh, are that A sound. So this kind of explains to me why it's an upside down E and not an upside down literally any other vowel, because every vowel letter can become a schwa sound, because in this origin, it could be used for either one of these two sounds. Nifty. So even though it's pronounced schwa in modern Hebrew, the spelling of schwa itself is actually from the German spelling for it. And I think this is one of the reasons I like the name schwa is that it kind of encapsulates its history being borrowed from Hebrew orthography. And then in the 19th century, a lot of German linguists used it for that sound. And so that S-C-H spelling is uh, the, the German spelling rather than uh and any other language. And most satisfyingly, it was first used by a guy called Schmeller, who has his name spelled S-C-H as well. (laughs) Johann Andreas Schmeller, uh, who uh, also used the schwa. Maybe that's why he liked it. It became big in the 19th century, and definitely by the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, was being used in texts to represent that sound. Yeah, and schwa is also very common in German. So a lot of words that end in E in German have that E pronounced in a schwa. So like the name, what in English would be Gabe, the German name Gabe, that er at the end is also a schwa. It definitely pops up in a lot of languages because it's quite efficient. And you also get this sort of optional schwa sound with E's at the end of the word in French. So you can have like long, but also longue, which is the word for long. Um, and there's a there's an E there that can kind of be optionally pronounced. And when it is pronounced, it's pronounced kind of like schwa. Hmm. And this gets to something kind of interesting because, you know, German and French have these schwas that are spelled with the letter E at the end of a lot of their words. But English instead has these completely silent E's at the end of a lot of its words. Mm, The bane of all children learning to read in English, the silent E. Ooh, bane! There's an example. (laughs) So words like bane and fame and fine and bone and meme... (laughs) <laughs> that that one is not one that I learned when I was in grade four spelling class. <laughs> so there are all these words that end in silent E in English. And the rule that I learned when I was in grade five spelling class was the silent E makes the vowel say its own name. Oh, I like that. I never learned that. That's very handy as trying to get your head around the rules of reading English. Yeah, it's really nice. I'm really jealous that I never learned that very efficient way of thinking about what E was doing. Yeah, but it's also, it's a rule that's kind of unsatisfying to me as a linguist now, because why should adding an extra vowel to the end of a word change how the vowel in the middle of the word is being pronounced? Like, that's something that I found kind of unsatisfying as a budding linguist. Like, what sort of process is that? Uh, I am going to, I mean, I know the answer, but if I had not known the answer, I would have taken a wild guess at it being 
retrospectively attempting to make sense of a historical process by pretending that there's some kind of like reason for it. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 not not what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, and the reason why they had to retrospectively come up with this rule is because the E used to be pronounced, uh, it used to be pronounced as our Frenchois, and they weren't just one syllable words, they were two syllable words. So it was Barne, Bane, and Farme, and Harme. Oh, so the, the schwa actually used to be pronounced there, so you'd get, instead of fine, like thinne, Instead of fame, farmer. Instead of home, homer. Or something like that. Yes, so you had two syllables instead of one syllable that we have now for fine, fame, home. And those syllables started with a consonant, ended with a vowel. And then over time, that schwa comes off at the end. It's very, uh, it's not as easy to always pronounce it. A bit like with the French example. In French at the moment, you can pronounce it or you don't have to, it's starting to erode away at the end of a word. And that was the process that happened in English. Right. This is really interesting because in English and in other Germanic languages as well, there's a difference between the kinds of vowels that you can have in a syllable where there's a consonant at the end and in a syllable where there isn't. So we have English words hid and hide, which have I and I in them both between H and D. But there's a word like hi, but there isn't a word in English he or fe or ke or me, even though all of these can be perfectly good as long as there's another consonant in them. So this is where the rules of English syllables interact with the rules of what sounds can go into them. And we used to have two syllables in words like fine and fame, and now we have one. So that little E sits there to remind us as a written fossil, even though we don't pronounce it anymore. Yeah, and it reminds us that the vowel that's in this first syllable, which is now the only syllable, is the kind that can exist without a consonant after it. So because we can have a word like hi and not a word like he, if there's that that E at the end, you have hi, d or something, then that sort of reminds us and by us I mean people who know this history, which is not most modern contemporary English speakers, uh, that this is the kind of word that has the sort of vowel that can exist in open syllables. For the rest of us, it's just a handy way to spell properly. But there was a special reason why it was schwa that was so easily lost at the end of all of these words like fine and home and hide. And that's because schwa is what's known as a reduced vowel. It's physically produced for a shorter amount of time than a full vowel like I or E or even I. It's what allows us to just sneak it in really quickly in syllables that we're not really focusing on. Yeah. And so if we produce some syllables faster or quieter than other ones, those faster or quieter symbols tend to also have schwas. And so this is why schwa crops up in all of these words regardless of what vowel they're spelt with. And I'm pretty sure Lauren, who really struggled to spell words because she couldn't distinguish the vowel because it was being pronounced with schwa when she was learning to spell, um, would have kind of said, why don't we just spell all the words with schwa and be done with it? But that wouldn't be the most practical solution. Right. Well, the problem is if we respell English to be consistent and like every time we say schwa, we write schwa, it works in the short term because we have this very transparent relationship between sound and spelling, which is nice. But the annoying thing, this fact that you can write any English vowel letter for the sound schwa is also a fact about the kind of structure of English. So there are all these words that are related to each other where we can see that relationship more clearly based on the spelling than we can sometimes with the pronunciation. So the spelling can help us notice when words are related to each other. So you take a word pair like acid and acidity. Acid and acidity. Well, that itty bit on the end of acid that turns it into acidity also changes the vowel to a schwa. Yeah, so acid and acidity. In the first one, we have a ah as the first vowel, and the second one, we have a. Uh. And yet, it still seems pretty intuitive that these words are related to each other. It's just that when we 
do have this itty on the end, we pronounce the main word. Instead of acid, we say acid. It would be inconvenient in the even medium turn to lose the relationship between, say, courage and courageous, just because we have that us on the end of courageous. Yeah, it's the same thing there. So courage, that the second syllable, idge, there's a schwa. But courageous, now there's a different vowel there, and it's just because we've added the us on the end. And yet, it's kind of nice that these two words that are very clearly related to each other still look the same. I guess it's particularly true as well of those word pairs in English that only differ because of stress. So, like, record and record are only different because of stress, and then we'd be spelling them differently because each one has a schwa in the opposite place. Yeah, so record, their schwa is in the erd, and record, your schwa is in the r. And so you'd have to swap the swap the schwa, schwas, swap the schwas. Wow, that's really hard to say. <laughs> swap the schwas, uh, and you wouldn't know what vowel to sort of recover from the syllable once you started stressing it. And it's the same thing with itty and us. When you make acid into acidity and courage into courageous, instead of stressing the a ah and the cur. You're stressing the id and the age, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the adding the extra bit to the word shifts where the stress is. Yeah, and it's these unstressed syllables where schwa, you know, not every unstressed syllable in English is a schwa, but a heck of a lot of them are. Yeah, I think we'll keep the spelling system as it is. <laughs> this was something that always used to come up for me back when I used to teach intro linguistics, and people would be trying to write things in the International Phonetic Alphabet for the very first time, so they'd go through each word and they'd say it really slowly and carefully. Mm. And what that would mean is that instead of saying acidity, they'd say something like acidity, okay. Or instead of saying courage, courageous, they'd have courageous, courage. Well, they've gone back to stressing every syllable, and so the schwas evaporate. Right! And so they'd write these words and they'd have no schwas in them all over the place. And you'd have to say, you can say this word like this if you're really saying it slowly and carefully and you're saying each syllable at once maybe to help someone spell it. You do have the full vowel there some level psychologically for a lot of people, especially because of the spelling that's influencing you to tell you it's there. But in normal speech at a regular pace, most of the time you do say schwa's a lot. And so it's a sort of interesting tension where, you know, many of our schwa's actually represent a sound that you could recover if you say the word slowly and carefully enough. Which is also kind of a reason to keep the spelling where it is, because there is some psychological reality to the non-schwa version as well. This discussion is very English-focused, I should say, because uh, it's something that English seems to do in particular, in terms of having this kind of stress and this reducing to schwa on unstressed syllables. In fact, it, it's a fairly prominent feature of the English accent, and I imagine it's something that gets transferred when English speakers are learning to speak other languages. It's probably the closest I've come to having the ability to understand what the English accent in other languages must sound like to native speakers of those languages. They must just think that we're failing to hit vowels all over the place. Yeah, like, why, why do all of your vowels become the same vowel? <laughs> and I think the inverse is also the case is that it's one of the trickiest things for people who are learning English from a language that doesn't do this, which is most of them, uh, to do is like be like constantly trying to hit this vowel that I don't even have. <laughs> of, you know, are, don't you want your vowels to all be very distinct from each other? And, you know, like schwa or not schwa is this very English thing. And the stress part about it being very important which syllable is stressed and which part of which word is stressed, mm -hmm. that's also a very English thing. So I find the most interesting place to notice how important stress is in English is when it comes to poetry. Sure, because a lot of poetry relies on having certain numbers of syllables and, you know, using stress is one way to kind of explore the rhythm of a poem or a poetic construction. Right. And so some of the oldest English, like mother goose rhymes, nursery rhymes, have consistent number of stressed bits per line mm -hmm. rather than consistent number of syllables. So if you have something like hickory, dickory, dock, the mouse ran up the clock, there's three stress bits per line, but the number of syllables is quite different. Yeah. And the same thing with limericks in English. 
it's not that there's a same number of syllables in each line, it's that the stress pattern is you have to have three stress syllables, three stressed syllables, two stress, two stress, three stress. And you can do that with a varying number of actual syllables in it. So something like there once was a man from Nantucket, three stresses, once, man, tuck, yeah. nine syllables. But a tutor who tooted the flute, also three stress, <laughs> two, two, flute, <laughs> but that's eight syllables. And a wonderful bird is the pelican, 10 syllables, but still three stresses. Huh, it's funny. My brain is so tuned to listening to the stress in these. I actually found it hard to count the syllables as you were going because I was so tuned into the limerick structure of stress. Yeah. So like a lot of very Englishy poetry styles, as long as you get the stress right, you can really mess with the syllables because English pays a lot of attention to the stress. Whereas in French, they don't have this individual unpredictable stress at the word level the way English does at all. So there's no like record versus record in French. Everything is just gets a bit of stress at the end of the phrase or sentence or utterance or what are you saying? So you mm -hmm. might say something like bonjour, but you could also say bonjour, comment ça va? And you just stress the jour or the va. You don't have to go anywhere in between and stress anything else. And this means that French poetry can't do this stress counting thing because there's no stresses for them to count. <laughs> oh, normally I spend a lot of time going, oh, poor English speakers, they're missing out. But poor French speakers, they're missing out on limericks. <laughs> I, I really don't know how you do a limerick in French. I think you'd have to like pick a number of syllables that is approximately equivalent and just do that. We've talked about this kind of schwa syllable relationship being very English focused for this episode, but it's not the only language in which schwa appears and uh, is a little bit kind of easy to drop once you have reduced the pronunciation of schwa. So we have French was one example you had, but in Indo-Aryan languages as well. So these are the languages of the same Indo-European family as English, but they're over kind of on the Indian subcontinent, so Hindi. I know about this because I had to learn Nepali and they have schwa as a vowel, and I guess a bit like the Hebrew writing system, for this vowel in particular, they just don't write it down. And so you have to know when to pronounce this vowel, kind of by memorizing. For some languages in the family, it's just gone all together. So it's another example of how schwa in some languages can be really eroded, but not in all languages. This is actually true in, in Mi'kmaq as well, oh. which is an Algonquian language spoken in Eastern Canada. So in their writing system, they use the apostrophe to represent the schwa sound, but the apostrophe is only added when the schwa is quote unquote unpredictable. Right. And if you can predict the schwa, then you just put in the schwa where you know it's supposed to go because as a speaker, mm -hmm. you say it. And of course, I am not very good. I, I don't, I don't speak Mi'kmaq, so I'm not particularly good at predicting where it goes. Unpredictable schwa is almost cooler than unstressed schwa. Yeah, so you can kind of predict it, but I'm, you know, the speakers actually know how to do it uh, properly, but it's not always represented in the writing system, which is, I guess, something it has in common with Nepali. Schwa has so many cheeky personalities. Schwa also shows up in English, speaking of being cheeky, as the vowel sound that people end up producing if you're an English speaker when you're trying not to make any vowel sound at all. So if you're trying to say the sound that the letter B makes, but you don't want to say B, you just want to say that sound by itself, you probably end up with like B, which is still a vowel, it's just schwa, because that's like the, the least vowel you can make. Just adding a little bit so you can get that B across. Yeah. It also shows up sometimes in people's names. So I knew somebody called Ksenia, and a lot of English speakers couldn't pronounce that Ks the KS at the beginning of her name. And so a lot of people end up, ended up saying Ksenia because by inserting a little schwa between, because that was how they were able to keep both the K and the S. Very handy. Although I like unpredictable schwa in Mi'kmaq, uh, one of the best things about schwa popping up in the particular context of unstressed syllables in English uh, means that schwa is set up for being just a really great source of jokes because when it comes to English, schwa is never stressed. And I think that's a life motto we can all get behind. <laughs> and this means that, you know, there are people who've made t-shirts saying, I want to be a schwa, it's never stressed. 
there's a great photo from Sandy Abel Adas who has made cookies for her students with schwa on them so that her students' finals will be stressless. Ah, I love <laughs> it. It's very so good. Cute. So I think the stress part uh, in the technical sense, there's this very tempting pun with the stress part in the, the vernacular sense. And I think because it's a sound that is everywhere and ubiquitous, but until you study linguistics, you don't know that it is all around you. And not only is it around you, but it has its own symbol and it has its own name. And I think that's why it's a bit of a kind of classic linguist iconography to have fun with. Uh, I hope that learning about schwa has not been stressful. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? You can get access to over 30 bonus episodes to listen to right now at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and other rewards. Recent bonus episodes include synesthesia, numbers, teaching linguistics, and a robo-generated episode of Lingthusiasm. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella, and our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs>